All right, today let's go from Cocoa Pod to chocolate on today's super intensive video. I'm not gonna lie, although this was a lot of fun, it was also a lot of hard work. In total, the process of going from cocoa bean to chocolate bar took me about two months. Not because it takes that long to make, but because I messed up several times and had to start over, as well as having to deal with some camera issues along the way that didn't allow me to film. However, in my folly, I learned a lot and I hope to pass what I learned so you don't make the same mistakes that I did. Chocolate making in general is a very complicated and intricate process, but today I'm gonna be showing you my very simplistic method of making chocolate. I'm gonna kind of cut corners and really reduce a lot of the complexity. However, I have to say, even at my, with my plebeian attempt at chocolate, it still turned out really good. I ended up with a bar that was really fruity and had a lot of flavor. It was actually very delicious. So let's go ahead and begin. So chocolate making has more or less four steps. We have fermentation, we have a kind of drying roasting step, we have a grinding step, and then lastly we have kind of a heating and tempering and molding step. So let's go through this one by one. All right, step one, let's start with our actual cocoa pods. Now these are them. They grow in deep tropical regions and they originate from Mesoamerica. However, I sourced mine from a fruit company that specializes in this exotic fruit and, and grows them in Miami, Florida. Now, for those keeping track at home, I'm pretty sure these are the Trinitario cultivars of cocoa. However, for this video, any kind of cocoa will work and you can typically find them online, although it's not super cheap. So the first thing we wanna do is split open these pods very carefully using a knife. We can cut it such that we can expose the interior of the cocoa pods. Now, I know inside it looks a little crazy. As you can see, the cocoa pod is surrounded by a shell and inside are the actual cocoa beans. Now if we scoop the beans out, you can see that each bean is surrounded by some fruity, pulpy flesh. Now this stuff is actually edible and is actually very delicious. It has almost a citrusy flavor, not at all what I expected. Now what we're actually after is not this fruity pulp, but we're actually after the interior of these seeds. Now if you cut one in half, you can see this kind of purpley bit. In fact, you can eat this. It is a little bitter and it has a very faint taste of chocolate, but through the process of fermentation, drying and roasting, we're gonna reinforce the flavors of the chocolate so that in the end we end up with this really familiar chocolate flavor. Now I'm gonna collect the beans from four pods, just scooping out the interiors and collecting into a bowl. With all the beans scooped out, it's time to begin the process of fermentation. Now the fermentation stage is extremely important in the process of making chocolate. This is the stage where a majority of the chocolate flavors and fruitiness are actually developed. Now I have to admit, the process of fermentation of these beans is pretty nuanced and complicated. Expert chocolatiers have written a lot of stuff about how different stages of fermentation are really important in regards of how much oxygen exposure there is and you know development of acetic acid and alcohol, which all play a role in how the chocolate ends up being flavored in the end. Now, despite this channel's name, all this is beyond my pay grade. So I took a simplistic route for fermentation. And honestly, the chocolate I ended up with was pretty good. So let's just follow my caveman attempt. So from our bowl of collected fruit, we can go ahead and place them into a very well cleaned container, preferably something like this where you can easily monitor what's going on inside. I also I had a little glass weight for fermentation, so I use this to weigh down the beans, although I'm not really entirely sure if this was necessary. Now, the name of the game is we're gonna let this ferment for about a week, but after about 24 hours, depending on how warm it is outside, you should start to see the effects of fermentation. The beans will start to change color and they'll also expel liquid. Traditionally, these are fermented in giant wooden crate where there's drainage and the expelled liquid can drain away from the beans. But for the small amount of cocoa beans, it didn't really seem to make a huge difference. About once every day or so, I would like to open up the container, stir it up with a clean spoon, and uh, specifically I did this on days one, three, and four of fermentation. On day four of fermentation, I opened up the top of the container and then covered it with a clean towel. And we're gonna let this ferment open for two or three more days, stirring every day until it looks like this. Allowing the fermented beans to be exposed to the air really helps kind of bring it to that final step. So after the full seven days, we're actually ready to move on to the next step. Now, not only does this stuff look funky, it also smells pretty funky and a little bit alcoholic. Don't worry though, that's totally normal. However, I do to say under the alcoholic funkiness, it will have an ever so slightly chocolatey smell. It almost smells like a chocolate liquor or something like that. All right, so now the next step is to dry these beans out completely. Traditionally, this is done in the sun, but the weather outside where I filmed this is cold and rainy, so that really wasn't an option for me. So I placed my beans into this combo dehydrator oven thing that I have and let it dehydrate for 24 hours. After the 24 hours, we can pull them out. And if you peel the shell off the beans, you'll see that there's actually a cocoa bean inside. And this is actually our chocolate. Now we aren't fully there yet because we'll still need to roast it, but you can start to see that the color's almost there. And if you smell it, it will still smell a little bit funky, but it will really start to kind of have that chocolatey smell. Now at this point, we're actually ready to roast the beans. 
beans. And there's a bunch of different methods for roasting, but again, we're just gonna go through the simplistic route. Now for this step, we're gonna do a two-stage roast. Now the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna roast the beans in an oven at about 325 degrees Fahrenheit or 160 degrees Celsius for about five minutes. This is gonna just kind of start the roast for the beans. After the five minutes, turn the temperature down to 275 Fahrenheit or 135 degrees Celsius for about 20 minutes. And I was really surprised how much in this relatively short roasting time really changed the beans. This roast really made my whole house smell wonderfully warm and chocolatey. And this is the stage where it goes from kind of being funky to full on chocolatey. So once we're done roasting, we can pull it out of the oven and let it cool completely. I let them sit actually for about two hours on the cutting board and just to really make sure that they're completely cooled down. Now, once they are cool, we can go ahead and peel the shells off exposing the cocoa nibs inside. And it might help a little bit to crack them first as I'm doing here. And I'm not gonna lie, this process was a little time consuming. It is very, but it's not. It's honestly not that bad. In total, it took about 10 minutes to peel all of them. Now, now some small fragments of shell still ended up in my cocoa nibs and you could either use a hairdryer to blow them away or I just simply picked them out by eye, just kind of leaning on the side of not collecting as much chocolate, but making sure that there weren't any pieces of shell left over in our container. All right, so once we have all our nibs ready, we are ready to move on to the next step, which is to grind them up and turn it into chocolate. But before you do, it's not a bad idea to weigh the total amount of cocoa nibs you've collected and that'll help kind of inform how much stuff to add later when we're making the chocolate bars. All right, so to start off with grinding, I used a mortar and pestle to break up the cocoa nibs. I was able to get a pretty rough grind at first using this method. Now, to be frank, if you wanna be able to get the level of smoothness of a commercial chocolate bar, you need a special piece of equipment known as a conch. And these will run you about $300. So, you know, that's that's kind of out of the budget for, for my video here. So instead I experimented with grinding these cocoa nibs um, with stuff I already have. This was an experiment, so feel free to mix and match how I did this to whatever works best for you. Now I poured the crushed cocoa nibs into a blender and let this go. And I also took this opportunity to add a little sugar. This will help balance the bitterness of the chocolate and how much you add is completely up to you. I'm more of a fan of the darker side of chocolate, so I only added about 20 grams of sugar to the chocolate, which gave me about an 85% dark chocolate. But if you wanna add more or also add milk powder to cut the bitterness down, feel free to do that. So using the blender did produce a much finer grind. However, it was constantly getting stuck in the corners and getting kind of really annoying to deal with. So I decided I got it somewhat fine. I would try to finish it in the mortar and pestle again. Back in the mortar and pestle, after about 10 minutes of vigorous work, I ended up with as fine as I was able to get it, which to be frank, wasn't too fine. Now I also know it looks like there's some big chunks here, but those are actually just clumps of fine fine powder that got compacted in the mortar and pestle. All right, so the cocoa has some natural oil in each of the beans. This is the stuff that is known as cocoa butter. Now, depending on how well we were able to grind this down, the cocoa butter will actually express itself into the powder and will kind of form a chocolatey liquid. However, as you can see, this isn't very oily and it's actually very dry. So we'll need to bolster this cocoa with some cocoa butter. So to my 120 grams of cocoa nibs, I added initially about 20 grams of cocoa butter, but I actually added about 10 more grams later. So for a total of 30 grams of cocoa butter. The cocoa butter will give us that chocolate bar texture but first we need to melt it so I pop this into the microwave for about two minutes and you really want to keep a close eye on this and just you might be different for your microwave you really want this just to melt you don't want it to overheat once it's melted it should look like this and just go ahead and add into the chocolate and stir it up now we're in the stage of melting tempering and molding the chocolate place the cocoa over a pot of boiling water to make a double boiler this will begin to melt everything together but however even after heating my chocolate still looked a little dry so this is when I added that 10 more grams of cocoa butter I mentioned earlier and this really seemed to do the trick we can see here now that we have a texture of something that almost looks like wet brownie mix and that's actually what we're going after. Now while heating the chocolate we really want to keep an eye on the temperature. Now that the chocolate is melted we need to temper the chocolate. Now this is a process where we basically align the crystals that form inside of the chocolate to form a uniform solid hard bar. If we don't do this step the chocolate crystals will kind of have a random orientation and we'll end up with something mushy and won't really snap when you break the chocolate bar. Now there's a million different ways to do tempering. Some involve using a marble slab and some metal spatulas. The easiest way is using something called beta crystals, which are just uh, crystals of cocoa butter. But for me, the most practical way of doing this and just kind of the easiest way is just to use a nice piece of dark chocolate from a chocolate bar. And this is what's known as uh, seed tempering. And this will provide a seed crystal for the chocolate to kind of form around and help align the chocolate. So to do this, let the chocolate cool down and once it reaches about 91 degrees Fahrenheit or 31 degrees Celsius, add a piece of dark chocolate from a nice chocolate bar into the melted cocoa and just stir it until it's fully melted. All right, now while it's still molten, go ahead and pour this into a mold. I'm using a silicon chocolate mold I got online and that seemed to work pretty well. Carefully pour the chocolate in and it doesn't hurt to give it the old tapa tapa to coax out any air bubbles. Once the molds are filled, it's just a matter of letting this thing cool down completely. For me, I left this in the fridge overnight. Now the next morning I returned for the moment of truth. I think it's beautiful. 
I couldn't have been any happier with these chocolate bars, at least how they look. Now, how did it taste? Well, as I said before, it was a little grainy, but that doesn't really bother me. The taste, however, was fantastic. It really had that nice, complicated, fruity, chocolatey flavor you get from a high-end chocolate bar. And I have to say it was a really fun process. And even though I had some issues, it was extremely interesting and gratifying to be able to make my own chocolate bar all by myself. I really hope that you actually, you know, if you have the time and energy and, and want that you actually try this process yourself. You know, if you get stuck anywhere or you have your own questions, I'm by no means an expert in the topic. I can share my experiences with you. Feel free to email me at my website, flavorlab at flavorlab.xyz. So if you enjoyed this video, please consider sharing it. Sometimes these longer videos don't get a lot of views and it's always difficult. All right, well, that's it for this week. If you have something you want me to make for you, please feel free to leave it in the comments down below. Bye.